Welcome to Learning Thursdays. I'm Dean Hale with the OASIS Learning and Development Unit and your host for today's presentation. Today's presentation is titled, Treating Substance Use Disorders in the Context of COVID-19. And our presenter is Dr. Kelly Ramsey, Associate Chief of Addiction Medicine for New York State OASIS. She will be joining us in just a moment. First, a word about Learning Thursdays. Learning Thursdays are offered to behavioral health professionals as a free learning opportunity with the goal of improving the knowledge and skills of the New York State Substance Use Disorder Workforce. As we strive to improve the lives of individuals needing prevention, treatment, and recovery services. A goal of Learning Thursdays is to support the professional development of the treatment, prevention, and recovery workforce. And we do this by offering regular presentations that are relevant to today's substance use disorder treatment professional. As always, if there are any questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to contact us at the Learning Thursdays mailbox. You can also use the same mailbox to express an interest in providing a future Learning Thursdays program. And now it's time to start the presentation and welcome Dr. Ramsey. So thank you everyone for joining us here today. I'm going to discuss treating substance use disorder in the context of COVID-19. First, let's go over the learning objectives. Discuss the epidemiology of overdoses pre-COVID-19. Discuss changes in substance use disorder during COVID-19, including preliminary overdose data during early COVID-19. Discuss risks of COVID-19 with people who use drugs. Discuss innovative practices in the delivery of substance use disorder treatment services during COVID-19. First, let's look at op opioid overdose deaths pre-COVID-19. We are now in what is termed the third wave in the rise in opioid overdose deaths. The first wave was the rise in prescription opioid overdose deaths. The second wave was the rise in heroin overdose deaths. And we have been in the third wave, the, the rise in synthetic opioid overdose deaths, primarily due to fentanyl and its analogs since approximately 2013. If we look specifically at opioid overdose, overdose deaths pre-COVID-19 from 1999 to 2019, we can see that uh, the most um, significant change that we've seen is the stark rise um, in, in increased synthetic opioid or fentanyl related deaths. Um, concomitantly with that, we can see that during the same period that we see the number of deaths rise due to fentanyl, we've actually seen a decline in those related to prescription opioids, including methadone and heroin. Unfortunately, we've also seen a significant rise in stimulant related overdose deaths pre-COVID-19 as well, due both to cocaine and methamphetamine use with drugs that have had fentanyl added to them, often unknowingly to those that are using them. So what were the United States overdose trends pre-COVID-19? So the age adjusted rate of drug overdose deaths in 2019 um, was 21.6 per 100,000. And this was higher than in 2018, which was at a rate of 20.7. Uh, in 2019, adults aged 35 to 44 years old had the highest rate of drug overdose deaths at 40.5 per 100,000. The average annual increase in the rate of drug overdose deaths involving synthetic opioids other than methadone, so again, we're talking about fentanyl, uh, illicit fentanyl and its analogs, was lower from 2017 through 2019, 9% per year, then from 2013 through 2017, in which it was 75%. In 2019, the rates of drug overdose deaths involving heroin, natural and semi-synthetic opioids and methadone were lower than in 2018. From 2012 through 2019, the rate of drug overdose deaths involving cocaine increased more than threefold from 1.4 to 4.9, while those involving psychostimulants which includes, uh, again, cocaine and methamphetamine with misuse potential increased more than sixfold from 0.8 to five. 
If we look at provisional CDC 2019 New York State overdose um, death data pre-COVID-19, we can see that actually at the tail end of um, 2019, overdose deaths started to rise again. So this was a good six months prior to the onset of COVID-19. In the next slide, we're looking specifically at, um, again, New York State overdose deaths pre-COVID-19. So if we look at all drug overdose deaths pre-COVID-19, um, you can see that the numbers actually um, decreased uh, in rest of state however, increased in New York City uh, itself. So the New York State total overall went down, however, the rate went up in New York City. If we look specifically at, again, um, New York State with respect to opioid overdose deaths specifically, we can see that in 2019, the numbers in um, New York City went up the numbers in the rest of state went down and overall New York state totals went down. So I'm gonna summarize that. So what were the New York overdose trends pre-COVID-19? Drug overdose deaths in New York state, so this is counties outside of New York City, decreased by 10% from 2018 to 2019. Opioid overdose deaths in New York State, again, counties outside New York City, decreased by 12% from 2018 to 2019. Drug overdose deaths in New York City increased by 4% from 2018 to 2019, and opioid overdose deaths in New York City increased by 8% from 2018 to 2019. Statewide, both outside of New York City and within New York City, 81% of all overdose deaths involved opioids. In the next slide, we're looking at opioid-related hospital emergency department use pre-COVID-19. So you can see a steady rise both in the U.S. national data and in the New York State data from 2010 until approximately um, 20, the end of 2017 where the, the data collection uh, we don't have after that point. However, it decreased, so from 2017 to 2018. And if we remember, overdose rates actually went down in 2018 compared to 2017, which is the first time that that occurred. So let's talk a little bit about changes in substance use disorder during COVID-19. We're going to discuss an increase in alcohol sales, both online and in person, an increase in underage drinking, increase in mental health, suicidal ideation, and substance use disorder symptoms, increase in other online addictive behaviors, increase in recreational cannabis sales, and anecdotal reports, and now preliminary data of increases in overdoses. So first, I'm going to talk about increase in alcohol sales during COVID-19. In the image on the left, you can see that the alcohol volume growth increased precipitously in early uh, COVID-19 during the pandemic. So whether we're talking about beer or wine um, or cider or spirits, that the amount of um, volume size that people were buying increased, particularly early in the pandemic. Um, and again, on the right-hand side, it's looking at an increase in online sales. So there was actually an increase compared to April of 2019. In April of 2020, so about a month after lockdown, there was an increase of 477% in online alcohol sales. This is looking again at increases in alcohol pack sizes that were purchased during COVID-19. And again, regardless of what type of alcohol you're talking about, whether it's beer, wine, cider, or spirits, people were bar buying larger quantities and um, amounts. So volume specific sizes, as well as the amounts, such as 30 packs instead of 24 packs or six packs. Now, some of that may have been hoarding early in the pandemic, but it also could indicate an increase in use. So the next topic I'm gonna to discuss is the increase in home delivery of alcohol to underage youth and intoxicated individuals during COVID-19. So this was from a Washington Post um, article from relatively early in the pandemic. This was in March of 2020. 
So it was regarding food service apps, such as Grubhub, DoorDash, and Uber Eats. And it was reported that California conducted an underage identification compliance for home deliveries of food and alcohol during the spring of 2020. So again, early in the pandemic. There was an 80% failure rate for identification checks at delivery by the food alcohol delivery services and a failure rate for identification checks by bars of 25%. So this means that in four out of five instances, underage young people were able to accept the delivery of alcohol without being asked for identification. Additionally, the delivery of alcohol to persons already um, intoxicated can lead to binge drinking. And obviously, we know that binge drinking by youth and young adults impairs judgment, which can increase the risk of injuries, including both uh, physical and sexual assault. Servers at bars and restaurants are trained not to serve alcohol to persons who are already intoxicated. Drivers for these food and alcohol delivery services obviously do not receive any kind of training to recognize a person who is already intoxicated and should not be served alcohol. So a couple of studies have come out looking at alcohol consumption in response to COVID-19 in the US. We're gonna talk about those for a few minutes. So first, the methods in this particular study. In May of 2020, a cross-sectional online survey of just under 1,000 individuals using a probability-based panel designed to be representative of the U.S. population aged 21 and older was used to assess alcohol drinking patterns before, so February 2020, and after um, April 2020 um, when COVID became an issue in the United States. Um, so again, the enactment of stay-at-home orders occurred for most places in March of 2020. So um, they looked at reported differences in alcohol consumption. Um, they computed those differences and, and they looked at associations, uh, associations between differences in consumption patterns and individual characteristics. So um, the following were the results. So compared to February of 2020, respondents reported consuming more drinks per day in April of 2020. So an increase of 29%, which was clinically significant. Um, and a greater proportion reported exceeding recommended drinking limits. So again, an increase of 20%, again, statistically significant, and an increase of binge drinking of 21%, again, statistically significant in April. These differences were found for all socio-demographic subgroups assessed. Um, February to April, differences in the proportion exceeding drinking limits were larger for men than for women and for black non-Hispanic persons rather than white non-Hispanic people. This next study also looked at alcohol consumption in response to COVID-19. So the methods of this study, for the current analysis, a survey study was conducted using data from the RAND Corporation American Life Panel, a nationally representative probability sample panel of adults. A comparison was done between the wave one baseline survey, so pre-COVID-19, which was from April 2019 through June 2019, and from the Wave 2 survey, which occurred during COVID-19 from May through June of 2020. Researchers compared the number of days of any alcohol use and heavy drinking defined as consuming five or more drinks for men and four or more drinks for women within a few hours, and the average number of drinks consumed in the last month before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's look at the results. There were over 1,500 adults that um, took part in this survey, and the mean age of the participants in the study was 56.6 years. The frequency of alcohol consumption increased by 0.74 days overall, a 14% increase from 2019 to 2020. In women, the frequency of alcohol consumption increased by 0.78 days, or by 17% from baseline. In adults aged 30 to 59 years old, the frequency of alcohol consumption increased by 0.93 days or by 19% from baseline. Three out of four adults consumed alcohol an average of one more day um, per month compared to baseline. Women experienced a significant 0.18 day increase in heavy drinking, representing a 41% increase from baseline. Women experienced an average increase in short inventory of problem scale, um, representing a 39% increase from baseline. 
nearly one in 10 women had increased alcohol related problems, regardless of how much more they consumed. So now we're going to move into a section to talk about the increase in mental health symptoms, suicidal ideation and substance use during COVID-19. Early in the pandemic, the MMWR publication out of the CDC uh, did a survey and determined these results. So during late June, 40% of US adults reported struggling with mental health or substance use. 31% reported an increase in anxiety or depression symptoms. 26% um, reported an increase in trauma or stressor related disorder symptoms. 13% reported that they had started or increased substance use and 11% seriously considered suicide. So let's drill down on those results a little bit. So 40.9% of respondents reported at least one adverse mental or behavioral health condition, including symptoms of an anxiety disorder or depressive disorder, 30.9%. Symptoms of trauma or stressor related disorders specifically to the pandemic. So they labeled that TSRD, and that was reported by 26.3% of the respondents. And again, as mentioned, that um, there was also an increase in reported substance use to cope with stress or emotions related to COVID 19 or persons starting to use substances in order to cope with COVID 19. And that was reported by um, 13.3% or an odds ratio of 2.36. The percentage of respondents who reported having seriously considered suicide in the 30 days before completing the survey was 10.7%. And it was significantly higher among respondents who were aged 18 to 24 years, in which 25.5% of them reported suicidal ideation. Minority racial and ethnic groups so Hispanic respondents um, reported suicidal ideation 18.6% of the time, non-Hispanic black respondents 15.1% of the time, self-reported unpaid caregivers for other adults 30.7% of the time, and essential workers 21.7%. There's also been an increase in other online addictive behaviors during COVID-19. So the increase in mental health issues during the pandemic has led to increased online pornography viewing, gaming, and gambling behaviors. There was a pilot study done in Spain during COVID-19 with persons with a gambling disorder, and they reported an in increase of 12% in increased gambling, increase in 46% of anxiety symptoms, and in 27% of depression symptoms. In a general population cross-sectional survey in Sweden during COVID-19, 4% reported an overall gambling increase during the pandemic, with obviously given that we were on lockdown and, and they were on lockdown, higher likelihood for online casinos, online horse betting, and online lotteries, and a lower likelihood, obviously, for any in-person sports betting. 8% reported drinking more alcohol during the COVID-19 crisis and overall gambling increases were independently associated with gambling problems and increased alcohol consumption. We have precedent for an increase in these types of behaviors um, during crises. So during financial crises in both Greece and Iceland in 2008, there were marked increases in gambling behaviors. There's also been an increase in cannabis sales during COVID-19. On the left-hand side, you see an increase in recreational cannabis sales. This was from March of 2020. So again, very early, right after lockdown due to COVID-19. So if we look at uh, recreational cannabis sales in the week of 3-16-20, so again, the first week in lockdown, the sales were markedly increased compared to the same week one year prior in 2019. There was 159% increase in California, 100% increase in Washington State, and 46% increase in Colorado. An analysis of a major darknet cannabis market between March, sorry, excuse me, January and, and March of 2020, during um, which, again, the world was starting to see the unfolding of the COVID-19 pandemic, online cannabis sales increased by 
And then in a, in a very interesting document, this was a white paper called the State of the Cannabis Industry in 2020. They looked at similar data. So on the left-hand side, you can again see that there was a, a spike early on um, after lockdown. So in, in March and in early April of 2020, and then a leveling. So the white paper showed a two-week spike in cannabis sales in March of 2020, around the time that the U.S. started to react to the COVID-19 and stay-at-home orders um, were starting to go into place. So it's speculated that the sales spike is likely due to panic buying or hoarding by consumers who were unsure when they would be able to access the dispensary going forward. Um, after that two-week spike, there was a slight decline, possibly attributable to those sale um, customers realizing that dispensaries would be deemed essential and remain open during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. And then afterward, there was a recovery period with a few more spikes leading up to for 2020 when sales stabilized. Um, though of note, they stabilized at a volume significantly higher than they were in 2019. So on average, 40% higher than 2019. Another interesting um, projected study looked at the projected deaths of despair due to COVID-19. So this study combined information on deaths of despair from 2018 as a baseline, which was using an N of uh, over 181,000, and projected levels of unemployment from 2020 to 2029, and then estimated the additional annual number of deaths based on economic modeling. So across nine different scenarios, the additional deaths of despair ranged from 27,644, meaning if we have a quick economic recovery with the smallest impact of unemployment on deaths of despair, to a high of 154,037, meaning slow recovery with the greatest impact of unemployment on the deaths of despair, with 75,000 on average being the most likely. So when we consider the negative impact of isolation and uncertainty on top of the economic impact in unemployment, a higher estimate may be more accurate of what we can expect. So starting relatively early in the pandemic, we started to hear anecdotal reports of overdoses in the U.S. during early COVID-19. I think the really important thing to remember is that data lags, so we will not have confirmation of all reports of overdoses for a minimum of 6 to 12 months. So they, actually the AMA or the American Medical Association recently, this was in the fall, issued a warning citing reports um, from officials in 34 states about the increased spread of synthetic drugs and rising overdose deaths. Suspected overdoses nationally, not all of them fatal, jumped 18% in March of 2020 compared with 2019, 29% in April, and 42% in May, according to the Overdose Detection Mapping Application Program, which is a federal initiative that collects data from ambulance teams, hospitals, and police. In some jurisdictions, such as Milwaukee County, dispatch calls for overdoses had increased as much as 50%. So something to keep in mind is as traditional supply lines are disrupted due to the pandemic, people who use drugs appear to be seeking out new suppliers and substances that they are less familiar with, increasing the risk of overdose and death. Synthetic drugs and less common substances are increasingly showing up in, in autopsies and toxicology reports per medical examiners around the country. And we've seen fentanyl continue to move west in the United States and methamphetamine moving east. So again, looking at these anecdotal reports a little bit more. So on the left-hand side is showing the data that I discussed on the previous slide. So that increase of 18% um, overdose rates in March of 2020, 29% in April, and 42% in May. So let's talk a moment about ODMAP and what that actually is measuring. So ODMAP provides near real-time suspected overdose surveillance data across jurisdictions to support public safety and public health efforts to mobilize an immediate response to a sudden increase or spike in overdose events. It links first responders and relevant record management systems to a mapping tool to track overdoses to stimulate real-time response strategic analysis across jurisdictions. 
So um, agencies basically can um, elect to participate in ODMAP and then they are allowed to um, provide data to the dashboard. So I put the website there for people who are interested, but important caveat to ODMAP is that these are not confirmed cases of overdoses or overdose deaths. Again, these are more first responder and hospital reports. So in order to confirm uh, overdose deaths, we have to wait for autopsies and toxicology reports. Again, more anecdotal data. So on the left-hand side, it's showing states reporting increases in drug overdose deaths um, in 2020. So Delaware, for example, reported an increase of 60%, followed by Washington State at 35%, et cetera. On the right-hand side is a data from um, Cook County Medical Examiner's Office. Uh, Cook County is the county where Chicago is in Illinois. And in this graphic, the dark green represents confirmed overdose deaths by autopsy and toxicology. But the probable overdose deaths, again, with a demarcation in March 2020, when Illinois stay-at-home orders began, the projected um, or probable overdose deaths uh, skyrocketed uh, in comparison to what they would have expected. The next one I'm going to talk about is surveillance data reports of the increased overdoses in an urban emergency department during COVID-19. So the method of this study, patients with opioid overdoses from pre-pandemic, so March to June 2019, and from during the pandemic, March to June of 2020, were identified from the electronic medical record of Virginia Commonwealth University, so one emergency department in Virginia. And let's talk about the results. So the number of non-fatal opioid overdose visits increased from 102 in the pre-COVID-19 period, March to June 2019, to 227 between March to June 2020 during the pandemic. In contrast, to give you another acute scenario, Compared with 2019, the total number of people coming in with an acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack diagnosis decreased from 41 to 31, and the number of overall emergency department visits at that ED decreased from 36,000 and change to 26,000 um, during COVID-19. Among patients who presented with a non-fatal opioid overdose in March um, to June 2019 compared with March to June 2020. The mean ages were not very different, 42 versus 40 years old. The vast majority were male, so 70% in 2019, 73% in 2020. And the majority were African American, 63% in 2019, 80% in 2020. And a significant minority were uninsured, 44% in 2019 and 40% in 2020. This slide is looking at an analysis of drug test results before and after the U.S. declaration of a public health emergency during COVID-19. So first, let's discuss the methods. This was a cross-sectional study of urine drug screen results from patients diagnosed with or at risk of a substance use disorder. Tests were ordered by healthcare providers between November of 2019 and July of 2020. So both pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. Each specimen was derived from a unique adult patient. They used um, confirmatory diagnoses um, to determine the, the positive toxicology results. So these were not preliminary tests, which, have a, which are done by a different methodology and have a higher um, false positive rate. So these were confirmatory tests looking specifically for cocaine, fentanyl, heroin, and methamphetamine. Prescribed medications were excluded. So there were 75,000 random specimens selected from each of two time periods. One was between November and early March of 2020, pre-COVID-19, and the other was from mid-March to, Ju to July of 2020, um, meaning during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the following were the results. Compared with the pre-COVID-19 period, the proportion of specimens testing positive during the COVID-19 period increased from just under 4% to 4.76% for, for cocaine, from 3.8% to 7.32% for fentanyl, and from 1.29 to 
6% for heroin and from 5.89 to 8.16% for methamphetamine. So all U.S. Census regions except the South Atlantic and the West North Central saw significant increases in the adjusted odds ratio for at least one drug. No U.S. Census region saw a significant decrease in the adjusted odds ratio. Um, in the next couple slides, we're going to be looking at, again, anecdotal reports of increased overdoses. These ones were in Ontario, Canada during COVID-19. So in June of 2020, the chief coroner in Ontario, Canada announced a 25% increase in suspected drug-related deaths between March and May of 2020 compared to the monthly median reported in 2019. And similar trends have been reported across the rest of Canada. Um, it is suspected that this increase in drug-related deaths is being driven by a combination of numerous factors, including an increasingly toxic unregulated drug supply, so again, in addition to fentanyl, other synthetic opioids that people have less experience with, um, barriers to access to harm reduction services and treatment, and physical distancing requirements leading to more people using drugs alone. And if you look at the graphic on the right-hand side, you can see that in the yellow, which is the pandemic cohort, regardless of what age group we're talking about, there were increased uh, opioid related deaths in each age group. In this slide, it's specifically looking at where um, resuscitation was attempted and naloxone was administered. Unfortunately, because of physical slash social distancing during COVID-19, more people are in fact using a loan and there is no one there to um, intervene and attempt resuscitation um, or to administer naloxone. So you can see that during the pandemic in the yellow bars, actually there are fewer attempts at resuscitation and fewer instances in which naloxone is administered, which obviously leads to more fatal overdoses. Next, we're gonna look at CDC preliminary opioid overdose data. So this is um, the data during COVID-19. So this is um, confirmed overdose deaths. So you can see when we're looking at um, 12 month periods here from July of one year to June the following year. And here we're looking at the time period of June of 2015 through June of 2020. Um, in New York State, whether we look in New York City, uh, whether we look at the rest of the state outside of New York City or New York State as a total, that overdose deaths have increased throughout the geographic um, areas of New York State. So let's summarize that. So um, opioid overdose deaths are represented in the 12 month increments. As I said, this is data reported to the CDC by both the New York State Department of Health and the New York City um, DOHMH. So the CDC does not release data for individual months, but we can see trends for New York by comparing 12 month increments as we're seeing on the previous slide. The total New York State opioid overdose deaths from July 19, 2019 to June of 2020 were the highest for any 12 month July to June period represented. So for the last five years from June 2015 to June 2020. The New York City totals were also the highest of any 12 month period ending in June. The New York outside of New York City totals were the second highest after the year um, ending in June of 2017. This again is looking at opioid overdose on data in uh, New York State, and this is looking at 12 month trends again through June 2020, and this is looking at um, July of 2019 through June of 2020. Again, we've seen numbers increase um, in New York outside of New York City. Um, in New York City, uh, it actually went down slightly, and then in New York State, the total went up slightly. So again, let's summarize that. So overdose totals by 12 month period have been increasing since the 12 month period ending in September, 2019. So that's important to note because the increase in overdose deaths after seeing a decrease in 2018 for the first time after uh, overdoses have been increasing every year since 2013 on, 
Um, in 2019, even before the pandemic started in 2020, overdose rates were starting to go up in the fall of 2019. And then the pandemic unfortunately exacerbated that trend. The biggest increases were in the 12 month periods ending in April and May of 2020, which obviously could be pandemic related. Even before the pandemic started, there were fairly large increases between the 12 month periods ending in January and February of 2020. So in other words, something was going on even before the pandemic started. This is actually a slide specifically of New York City DOHMH overdose data through quarter one of 2020. And again, you can see starting in quarter three of 2019 that overdose numbers were starting to increase and that trend continued through the first quarter of 2020. Uh, we only have data thus far through the first quarter of 2020. I expect we'll have second quarter data of 2020 fairly soon. The next section I'm gonna talk about the risks of COVID-19 with people who use drugs. I'll talk briefly about the risks of smoking, vaping, methamphetamine, psychostimulant use, and opioid use for people who use drugs, and go over a retrospective case control study in patients with substance use disorder with COVID-19. We'll talk a little bit more about the risk of using a loan, decreased use of the emergency department, and disruptions in the services for people who use drugs and in the drug supply. So first, let's talk a little bit about the risks of COVID-19 for people who use drugs. So very early in the pandemic, Nora Volkow, MD, the director of NIDA, wrote in her blog on 4-6-2020 of what she suspected the risks were um, for people who use drugs with respect to COVID-19. So she um, discussed the potential increased risk for those who smoke tobacco or marijuana or vape due to effects on their lung health, the potential increased risk for those who use opioids or methamphetamine or other psychostimulants due to the drug's effects on pulmonary and respiratory health due to hypoxemia, increased risk for overdose due to opioids, and blood vessel constriction associated with methamphetamine and other psychostimulants. She also discussed the potential increased risk for people who use drugs due to decreased access to healthcare, increased rates of incarceration and homelessness, and disruption in services, including syringe exchange and recovery support services. In the summer of 2020, Nora Valka was one of the uh, authors for a study that looked specifically at risks for COVID-19 for people who use drugs. So this is a retrospective case control study using electronic um, health record data of over 73 million unique patients, of whom a little over 12,000 had a diagnosis of COVID-19. Patients with a recent diagnosis within the past year of substance use disorder were at significantly increased risk for COVID-19 with an adjusted odds ratio of almost nine. So compared to patients without substance use disorder, patients with substance use disorder had significantly higher prevalence of chronic diseases, including chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, lung disease, um, type two diabetes, obesity, and cancer. Among patients with a recent diagnosis of substance use disorder, African-Americans had significantly higher risk of COVID-19 than Caucasians, an adjusted odds ratio of 2.173 with the strongest effect for opioid use disorder with an adjusted odds ratio of 4.162. COVID-19 patients with substance use disorder had significantly worse outcomes with respect to death and hospitalization than general COVID-19 patients. So almost double the percentage for death and about a third um, more of the percentage for hospitalization. And African Americans with COVID-19 and substance use disorder had the worst outcomes um, compared with Caucasians. So again, higher rates of death and hospitalization. So this slide is actually showing in pictorial form the results that I just discussed. So if we look at the graphic on the left, we can see that the real risk is with recent substance use disorder diagnosis, so a, a, an active substance use disorder within the last year, comparatively to the much lower risk of having a lifetime substance use disorder. 
And we can see that regardless of your substance use disorder diagnosis, so whether it's cocaine use disorder, opioid use disorder, tobacco use disorder, cannabis use disorder, et cetera, the risk is significantly increased with opioid use disorder putting individuals at the highest risk. And on the right-hand side in that graphic, we can see again that a recent substance use disorder, but also a lifetime substance use disorder puts you at higher risk <clears throat> for um, both hospitalization and death compared to the overall population of COVID-19 patients. And if you were African-American, your risk was much higher than Caucasians. So let's talk about some additional risks for um, people who use drugs with respect to COVID-19. So using a loan, which we've talked about a little bit already, due again to either physical or social distancing. So this increases the risk for overdose. There's no observer present to give naloxone, and this therefore leads to more fatal overdoses as opposed to non-fatal overdoses where naloxone is used to reverse the overdose. There are also increased triggers for uh, relapse with increased mental health symptoms and despair due to social isolation. So there was also a substantially decreased use of the emergency department. So the National Syndromic Surveillance Program found that emergency department visits declined by 42% during the early COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, from a mean of 2.1 million um, visits per week in a comparator time from March to April of 2019, down to 1.2 million visits uh, in March to April of 2020, with the steepest decreases occurring in persons aged less than or equal to 14 years in females and in the Northeast, which makes sense because that's where the pandemic hit the earliest in, in spring of 2020. So this uh, is another look at decreased use of the emergency department. So this, the striking decline in emergency department visits nationwide with the highest declines in regions where the pandemic was the most severe in April of 2020, which obviously makes sense, um, suggests that the pandemic has altered the use of the emergency department by the public because people were afraid of getting sick if they went to the emergency department. So persons who use the emergency department as a safety net because they lack access to primary care and telemedicine, for instance, perhaps they don't have the bandwidth or they don't have the technology, might be disproportionately affected if they avoid seeking care because of concerns about the infection risk in the emergency department. So the recent pandemic um, brings with it a rapid halt to many of the advances that have occurred in the emergency department for the treatment of opioid use disorder because um, patients basically were not presenting to the emergency department and therefore were not available to be treated. They were avoiding the emergency department just like everyone else was early in the pandemic. So in just one month from March to April of 2020, Patients with opioid use disorder, and that was determined by ICT-10 billing codes, visiting the University of Alabama at Birmingham Emergency Department. So this is a 75,000 annual patient visits per year urban hospital. Um, persons with opioid use disorder, um, they dropped by approximately 60% in ED visits. So that's a precipitous dip that was notably overshadowed um, an overall ED volume decrease of less than 30%. So the overall ED volume decreased by 30% in that time period um, decreased use by persons with opioid use disorder specifically was double that at 60%. And in addition, compared to the prior year, so pre-COVID, April 2020, OUD patient volumes were down, again, about 50%. Um, so decreased use of the emergency department, generally speaking, by people who use drugs means decreased use for non-fatal overdoses, acute withdrawal symptoms, buprenorphine inductions for opioid use disorder, and linkage with recovery support. So what about disruptions in services for people who inject drugs? So with respect to syringe service programs, people who inject drugs in many settings um, are encountering reduced access as existing SSPs had closed or restricted their hours, raising concerns about unsafe injecting practices due to inadequate access to harm reduction supplies and barriers to maintaining regular services 
were most likely due to lack of PPE for workers at certain service programs, along with initial confusion with directives to close services that were deemed non-essential. However, the CDC's interim guidance did clearly state um, a couple months after the pandemic was um, affecting uh, programs that FSP should be considered essential because they can reduce overdoses and transmission of infectious disease as well as help detect COVID-19 cases and prevent additional cases. What about disruptions in um, substance use disorder treatment services for people who use drugs? So despite clear guidance from ASAM, SAMHSA, CMS, OASIS, and OMH regarding delivery of substance use disorder treatment services during COVID-19 and payment enhances during COVID-19, the Addiction Policy Forum reports that one in three, or 35% of people who use drugs, report changes in treatment or recovery support services due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 14% say they were unable to receive their needed services, and 2% said they were unable to access naloxone services. Um, some comments on changes to services included the following. The closing of recovery drop-in, peer-run recovery centers, no ability to socialize or connect or get peer support. Another respondent commented, meetings have all been reduced to Zoom, and it has had an impact on feeling supported by peers and getting a good recovery message. There was also decreased inpatient capacity due to social distancing requirements and quarantine isolation requirements, as well as wards um, being sequestered for COVID-19 patients. So what about disruptions in the drug supply for people who use drugs? So border restrictions and stay-at-home orders around the world have also made it harder for producers of illicit drugs to acquire the so-called precursor chemicals needed to manufacture drugs such as heroin and methamphetamines. According to the DEA, one drug that remains widely available in much of the U.S. is fentanyl, the synthetic opioid that is causing the vast majority of uh, overdose deaths. And it's disturbing um, because the U.N. report um, points out that during um, past disruptions of the drug trade, people shifted from heroin to fentanyl, re resulting in more overdoses, and we don't seem to have a problem with the heroin, I'm sorry, with the fentanyl supply. With reduced crowding in public places, drug dealing may also be harder to conceal, requiring greater reliance on indirect means of sourcing illicit drugs, such as online markets and social media, and modes of delivering drugs, such as the postal service all of which carry some risk, not only of detection, but also potentially of contracting COVID-19 to those who sell and purchase drugs. Um, given the most almost universal restrictions imposed on air traffic, the supply of drugs by air may be completely disrupted. It is also likely that as a reaction to a reduction in opportunities for drug traffickers to distribute drugs in local markets owing to the lockdown, actors along the drug supply chains may be stockpiling drugs which means they would influx the market when the pandemic wanes. So let's look um, more specifically at disruptions in the drug supply for people who use drugs. So harmful patterns deriving from drug shortages include an increase in injecting drug use and the sharing of injecting equipment and other drug paraphernalia, which obviously all carry the risk of spreading bloodborne diseases such as HIV, hepatitis C, or even COVID-19 itself if people are not social distancing. Um, risk resulting from drug overdose may also increase among people who inject drugs and who are infected with COVID-19 and exposure to potentially more dangerous substances. The graphic on the right I found extremely interesting. So this is looking at disruptions in the drug supply and it's looking at drug by um, type of drug and then it's looking at at type of transport, so vehicle, land versus sea transport versus air versus mail. So opioids, for instance, are primarily transported by a vehicle or land, whereas cocaine is primarily by sea transport. Um, so I found this very interesting because, again, depending on what the modality of transport is would um, determine how disrupted the supply is for that particular type of drug. So now let's look specifically at um, emergence of other substances during uh, COVID-19. So first let's talk about the emergence of isotinidazone. So this is not a new synthetic opioid, but it has reemerged during COVID-19. 
So it is comparable to fentanyl in effect. It's actually slightly more potent than fentanyl, and it behaves a lot like fentanyl. So in other words, it activates the mu opioid receptors in the brain, and it can be blocked or reversed in its effects by naloxone. Again, similar to fentanyl and other potent synthetic opioids, you may need to use more naloxone to reverse the overdose because it's a stronger drug than, for example, heroin or morphine. On the right-hand side is looking at isotinidazine identifications and overdoses as of April of 2020. And you can see that they're primarily in the Midwest with the most cases actually being in Illinois. Next, let's look at brorphine. So brorphine is a highly potent synthetic opioid um, recently encountered as both a single substance of misuse and in combination with other opioids such as heroin and fentanyl. In mid-2019, brorphine emerged in the U.S. drug market and forensic labs identified um, it four times in 2019, and they had 10 reports um, thus far in 2020 um, when I made this slide, which was the fall of 2020. The presence of new synthetic opioids with no approved medical use exacerbates the epidemic. The introduction of a new synthetic opioid to the illicit market in the context of a pandemic is obviously harmful and causes deep concern. The other unfortunate thing with the name brorphine is I've heard people confuse it with the treatment for opioid use um, disorder, which is buprenorphine. Let's look at some innovative practices in the delivery of substance use disorder services during COVID-19. We'll talk a little bit about telehealth, low threshold virtual buprenorphine clinics, innovative patient-centered practices in uh, opioid treatment programs or OTPs, methadone delivery service in New York City, and harm reduction services. So this slide is looking at the increase in telehealth services for MOUD, or medications for opioid use disorder. And this information was called from Medicaid claims data, and it showed um, a substantial increase in telemedicine visits with the comparator being March, April of 2019 to March, April 2020. So in March and April of 2019, there were 244 Medicaid claims for medication for opioid use disorder visits, and that jumped to 27,348 in March, April of 2020. I'm going to show it graphically on the next slide. So here is looking at telehealth claims by type of substance use disorder service between March 1st of 2020 and April 30th of 2020, and it's comparing detox, inpatient rehab, OTP, outpatient and residential services. And you can see a marked increase in outpatient services from delivery of 20% of services in March of 2020 to 80% of services via telehealth in April of 2020. So a really rapid pivot by the outpatient substance use disorder treatment system in response to delivery of services during the pandemic. So let's talk about low threshold virtual buprenorphine clinics. So in Rhode Island, there was a buprenorphine hotline. This was called a telebridge clinic via telephone to start persons uh, with opioid use disorder on buprenorphine and link them with ongoing services. So this um, emerged rapidly once federal regulations were loosened early in the pandemic to allow for um, non-in-person buprenorphine inductions. So it allowed for either video visits um, with a patient, for example, from their home, or even audio-only telephone visits to initiate buprenorphine, which had not been allowable prior to the pandemic. So this hotline was an alternative to physical bridge clinics, which are often housed in emergency departments. Again, people were not going to the emergency department during the pandemic, so having to come up with uh, an alternative treatment model. And in New York State, in the New York City public hospital system, NYC Health and Hospitals quickly established a low threshold telehealth, so video and or audio only, buprenorphine clinic during the height of the pandemic at its epicenter in New York City. Patients were accepted at the clinic regardless of comorbidities or insurance uh, status. So they actually did a study um, based on the New York City clinic. So the objective of the study was a feasibility and clinical impact study to assess telemedicine-based 
opioid use disorder treatment with buprenorphine naloxone during COVID-19. The methods were a retrospective analysis of adult New York City residents with opioid use disorder eligible for enrollment in the NYC Health and Hospitals Virtual Buprenorphine Clinic between March and May of 2020. So they had 78 participants in this study. Follow-up data um, were comprised of rates of retention and treatment at two months, referrals to community treatment, and induction-related events. So the results. During nine weeks of clinical operations, again, during that very early part of the pandemic in New York City, 78 persons were inducted on buprenorphine, and there were 252 visits that were conducted in total. Referral sources were diverse and included some of the following, jail reentry program at Rikers Island for a little over 14%, homeless shelter staff for almost 17%, and non-NYC H&H providers for over 28% of their referrals. At eight weeks, 53.8% of the patients remained in care, 26.9% were referred to a community treatment program for ongoing care, and 19.2% were lost to follow-up. No patients were terminated from care, and adverse clinical outcomes were very uncommon. Um, there was persistent opioid withdrawal syndrome in 4.3%, which is primarily a result of fentanyl, which is in the vast majority um, of uh, toxicologies, for example, of people who are using opioids are using something that has fentanyl in it, again, whether knowingly or unknowingly. And because of the pharmacology of fentanyl, um, it's very lipophilic, which means that even though it's a quick on and off euphoria or high associated with it, it actually takes much longer to metabolize in the body. You have to be in withdrawal in order to start buprenorphine. So subjectively, patients might experience what they think is withdrawal. However, um, there is still fentanyl hanging around in their system, and if they take buprenorphine too early, um, then they actually make their opioid withdrawal syndrome worse. So that's what that persistent opioid withdrawal syndrome is. And there was one non-fatal overdose. So their conclusions from the study were that telemedicine treatment of opioid use disorder with buprenorphine naloxone is a safe and feasible approach even in a vulnerable patient population during a pandemic. So what are some of the potential advantages of telehealth buprenorphine services? So there's convenience for the patient. So it eliminates many barriers to substance use disorder treatment, such as transportation, mobility issues, childcare issues, flexibility of appointments outside of traditional business hours. It allows access to buprenorphine prescribers for patients in remote areas. It allows enhanced, more frequent communication between the patient and the clinical team members via apps, texting, telephone, video, and or audio services. Many of these things were prohibited prior to the pandemic. However, um, allowing non-HIPAA compliant platforms really allowed for increased communication options between clinical teams and patients. Um, it can lead to increased privacy and decreased stigma by people being able to be seen from home or another location that's convenient for them. It allows social distancing during a pandemic and it gives providers insight into patients' lives and could increase the pr provider-patient therapeutic alliance. Uh, before I left my previous job and came to Oasis last year during the pandemic, you were able to actually see where people were living you often met people they were living with or their animals, and you got to kind of see an insider's view to what was actually going on in their life. What are some potential disadvantages of telehealth buprenorphine services? So this model may be less appropriate for some patients who are more unstable and maybe need additional support. The model is geared towards those with access to smart technology and some technological literacy, so, for example, if there is not ongoing parity with respect to telephonic audio only visits and reimbursements rates, this could actually exacerbate social inequities by, for example, requiring people who don't have a smartphone to come in for visits while allowing people who do have a smartphone to have visits at home. Um, home environments are convenient, but they may be chaotic. There may be privacy concerns, or for example, there may be intimate partner violence going on in the home, therefore not allowing the patient to be uh, open with you. 
payment models may or may not support ongoing telehealth. I think that's to be determined. And more efficacy studies are still needed for assessing the treatment of opioid use disorder from home via telehealth services. So next, let's look at innovative practices um, reimagining patient-centered care in, Bronx, in a Bronx OTP or opioid treatment program. So the context of this was March to May of 2020 in the Bronx and New York in five OTP settings. So with respect to patient-centered care, let's, let's look at what we mean by that. So Bronx OTP patients were at increased risk for COVID-19, both due to their comorbidities and their race ethnicity. Um, so basically the OTPs pivoted quickly. They ceased toxicology and they focused instead on engagement in care and patient-centered goals. Within two weeks at the beginning of the pandemic, they reduced the proportion of persons with a take-home schedule of five to six times per week of coming into the OTP to take their methadone dose um, from 47.2% of their patient population, so almost 50% of their patient population being on that almost everyday schedule down to 9.4%. And again, this was allowable under the leniency by SAMHSA and the DEA with respect to methadone take-home schedules during the pandemic, which allowed for stable patients to be given up to 28 days of take-home doses and less stable patients to be given up to 14 days of take-home doses. So what were the outcomes during this period of take-home leniency at these five Bronx OTPs? There were six non-fatal overdoses, no fatal overdoses, 20 deaths due to COVID-19. So the comparison data from the, the time period of January to pre-COVID-19 lockdown of March 2020 were two non-fatal overdoses and one fatal overdose. So initially, medical providers, I think, were worried about giving increased take-home flexibility that this would lead to diversion or lead to increased overdoses. We have not thus far seen any data to support increased overdoses related to methadone um, in the overall view of increased overdoses during the pandemic. They've been due to fentanyl, not due to methadone. So another innovative practice that happened was methadone delivery service in New York City. So the New York City um, DOHMH and New York State Oasis launched a program to deliver methadone to patients with COVID-19, COVID-like illness, or at high risk of COVID-19. In a first for New York City, 20 New York City DOHMH staff working in teams of two were making curbside deliveries of methadone to patients' homes and to city-run isolation hotels where people with COVID-like illness or diagnosed with COVID-19 were isolating if they had nowhere safe otherwise to do so. The program um, can make up to 1,300 deliveries per month, and to reduce the risk of COVID-19, staff were equipped with masks, hand sanitizer, wipes, and obviously underwent um, safety training, including best practices for maintaining social distancing. So in response to COVID-19, the federal government, as I previously mentioned, loosened the regulations around methadone. So allowing local governments to coordinate methadone delivery to high-risk patients, and as I mentioned, allowing up to 28 doses of methadone for take-home for stable patients, up to 14 doses for less stable patients. Furthermore, patients could also assign a family member or a member of their household to pick up their methadone for them. And currently, 40% of New York City residents who take methadone have someone else pick up their methadone on their behalf, or what's called a designated other. What are some other innovative practices that have occurred during COVID-19? So there have been innovative harm reduction practices, including virtual naloxone trainings, there's been an increase in mail order naloxone and other harm reduction supplies um, shipping directly to the homes of people who use drugs. An example of that is at the website www.nextdistro.org. And there's uh, emerged a hotline called Never Use Alone, which is an overdose prevention call in line. So a person who is using a loan, again, because of social distancing during COVID-19 can call this number and they will remain on the line with them while they're using. And if at some point they become unresponsive, they will dispatch 911 to them. 
On this next slide is, is some um, opioid overdose prevention resources through OASIS. So the first one is the uh, OASIS Overdose Prevention Landing Page, which we created um, during the pandemic in, in June, July of 2020. There's also a video on overdose prevention, and they're always available as the 24-7 Hope Line, which you can either call or text. This slide shows some opioid uh, um, overdose prevention social media messaging that OASIS did during a media campaign last summer. So just some final conclusion. So anecdotal reports early on during COVID-19 from proxy sources such as ODMAP that we discussed earlier, and now preliminary data from the CDC and the New York City DOHMH indicate that an increased number of overdoses have occurred during COVID-19. There is preliminary data from the CDC on increased mental health symptoms, suicidality, and substance use during COVID-19. Federal and state regulations have loosened to accommodate substance use disorder services during COVID-19. The hope is that increased health flexibility and increased low threshold access to medications for opioid use disorder will remain permissible from a federal perspective after the declared public health emergency. But we don't know that that's going to happen. Substance use disorder treatment providers have had to pivot and flex during COVID-19 to continue to deliver services in an effective manner to persons with substance use disorder. And innovative practices to serve uh, people who use drugs have emerged during COVID-19 and I suspect will continue post COVID-19. So I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I hope this presentation was helpful for you. I want to thank our presenter, Dr. Ramsey, for today's program. I hope you will all find it useful while assisting clients in need of services. Your feedback is important to us. It helps us to know if we are meeting your educational goals and expectations. Once you have viewed the presentation in its entirety and completed the quiz, please follow directions to access the SurveyMonkey website and take a moment to complete the evaluation. Once again, thank you for joining us and keep up the good work.